What, in your opinion, is considered a crime against food? I would also like to share a good rule of thumb, the power level of your food should follow the water content of your food. Clear soup. Full power. Risotto-medium power. Butter-low power. Reason being that a microwave heats food by transferring energy to the water molecules in your food. Anything else in your food doesn't get heated directly, but indirectly by energy transfer from the water molecules to their surroundings. This takes some time. If you put the power too high it will heat unevenly and the water starts to evaporate instead, which can cause the texture of your food to degrade or in the case of butter causes the splashing, because vapor takes a lot more space than the water. Microwaves do work on pretty much all the electrons in the food, not just the water. Water molecules just happen to be one of the easiest molecules for dielectric heating to do work on. But 2.4 GHz radiation is extremely effective at heating other common foods such as lifts. That's why full power heating can destroy chicken skin and other layers of animal fats. It's extremely sensitive to having work done on it and it heats up much more quickly than water. That probably has a lot more to do with the issues regarding butter than the work the microwave is doing on the water molecules. Pro chef and had my cousins from out of town come in and eat. I pop out to say hi with their orders, and they both dumped salt all over their food as I was setting it in front of them. Picked up the salt before the fork. We didn't have shakers on the tables, but stashed away. They requested salt shakers when they ordered. My mom cooked most of the meals when I was growing up, back in the dawn of time, until I was old enough to cook for myself. She came from a school of cooking that you should never add salt or pepper to any dish, as different people like different amounts, and it's always on the table. I habitually added salt and pepper to my food without tasting it first for ages, because my experience was it was always needed. Maybe your meal comes from the same school. That was a direct result of the sugar industry. That used to be a crazy conspiracy theory until it turned out to be true. The sugar industry spearheaded the demonization of fat in the U.S. People in the sugar industry paid scientists going all the way back to the 60s to shift the national focus to fat and heart disease and minimize the terrible effects of added sugar. I'm biased because I live in NYC and chicken parm has been one of my favorite foods since I was a kid. But my girlfriend once told me a story about a friend of hers who lived in a more rural area without access to a lot of Italian-American food. When they were planning to move to NYC apparently their parents served them chicken parm that consisted of a slice of melted American, or cheddar, maybe, cheese atop a piece of chicken with apparently minimal or no sauce. Their parents said bet you won't find find good chicken parm like this in NYC. Apparently, they were not joking. I hit financial rock bottom in 2019 and survived on the reduced price food at the supermarket. 
it's all the stuff that's either about to go bad or the packaging is damaged so they mark it down 75% in a last ditch effort to sell it. I actually ended up learning how to cook because of it. I started earning more money in March of 2020 and literally the day I got my first bigger paycheck, the panic buying started. So I continued eating the reduced price food anyway because that was all that was left. Yep. Gotta go in early. I got a slab of salmon for $30 that was normally almost $70. The cashier was like, they never mark this down. Apparently the workers usually snag the really good stuff but I guess they slipped up. We had lemon grilled salmon that night and the rest went into the freezer. Almost 5 pounds of boneless salmon fillets. Walmart seems to put their section randomly around the store. But for their general merchandise there's a usually spot near the garden center. Kroger usually has it near or on the seasonal aisle slash area for general merchandise while the bakery and deli has their own section also Frozen has a spot and Dairy sometimes has a spot. HEB tends to put it back near the milk case shoved next to a fire exit. Now if you look at it from a community perspective the answer is big lots the entire store. In a UK supermarket, it will be on the end of a random aisle, you just have to look for it. Mostly look for bright yellow stickers. Also, if you go in the evening, and head to the hot food section, there will often be stuff there that nobody has bought and cannot be left until the next day. You will get some good bargains there. I'm talking a 6 pounds and 50 pence whole cooked chicken, for 3 pounds. I love the whoops section of Asda and Tesco you get loaves of bread for 13p and punnets of strawberries for 61p. Hell, two years ago both shops were just giving you a free bag of carrots and parsnips on December 26th just to get the things off their shelves after overstocking at Christmas. I don't think I've actually ever bought full price detergent or shampoo since 2011, you toddle to the reduced section and they have a giant bottle that's been put there at one pound and fifty pence because it's missing the dispensing cup or the packaging style has been updated. The only thing I wouldn't buy from that section would be the bashed tins. Don't trust seriously bashed tins, you don't know if they might have microscopic cracks at the seams that could make the contents into a food poisoning party. If I learned anything in terms of food, sometimes the cheapest cuts of meat and the marked down vegan slash vegetable stuff is awesome tasting once you learn how to cook. I bought pork bones, basil, tomato and some other cheap stuff once, onion, maybe a red pepper, then a loaf of Italian bread. Bone marrow bruschetta. So amazing. Tasted like something you would pay 30 bucks for a small plate at a fancy place. Google a recipe. If you are vegan, do the same recipe maybe with tofu and portobello mushrooms and the correct seasoning profile, and maybe some peanut oil or sesame drizzle or whatever, some kind of umami combo basically. We don't have a food shortage in the US, prior to COVID at least. Any hunger is the result of a logistics issue. If you're hungry, 
there are places you can go to eat for free. The question is whether you're able to get there, how you'll get back, etc. A Catholic church in Flint was giving away fresh produce last year. Tons of it. Hardly anyone came, so they had to beg people on Facebook to come take the food. Still hardly anyone came so they literally said even if you don't need it, it's all going to go to waste so please come take it. So the wife and I went out there and went home with numerous bags of potatoes and apples and cabbages and all sorts of stuff. We were the only people there and we barely put a dent in the stockpile. If you know of any restaurants that source locally grown foods, they often have a minimum they agree to buy per week and it's often more than they use so they have these leftover you were talking about. Usually you can ask to purchase their leftovers, and since they're planning on tossing them they're usually happy to sell you some. Often cheaper than if you went to the store yourself. I'm not sure about big chains but I know several local places, and hear tales of other people's local eateries backslash pubs, that are usually happy to. Some may even have it listed on their menus. In the contemporary process, corn is milled to extract corn starch and an acid enzyme process is used in which the cornstarch solution is acidified to begin breaking up the existing carbohydrates. High temperature enzymes are added to further metabolize the starch and convert the resulting sugars to fructose. 15. 808 to 813 The first enzyme added is alpha amylase, which breaks the long chains down into shorter sugar chains, oligosaccharides. Glucoamylase is mixed in and converts them to glucose. The resulting solution is filtered to remove protein, then using activated carbon, and then demineralized using ion exchange resins. The purified solution is then run over immobilized xylose isomerase, which turns the sugars to 50, 52% glucose with some unconverted oligosaccharides and 42% fructose, HFCS42, and again demineralized and again purified using activated carbon. Some is processed into HFCS90 by liquid chromatography, and then mixed with HFCS42 to form HFCS55. The enzymes used in the process are made by microbial fermentation. 15. 808-813-3, 20 20-22. Basically, corn is fed to bacteria that convert the starch to sugar. And to be specific, corn syrup is 100% glucose, HFCS has some of that glucose converted to fructose. What makes HFCS so sinister is that it's the perfect food additive. It's a liquid which makes it extremely easy to account for in industrialized food production, it readily mixes, it tastes great and most people report that anything it's added to tastes better, it helps make foods more presentable by aiding in the cooking process, and because it's pure sugar, it lasts forever. Oh, and because it's made from corn, it's subsidized out the ass and unbelievably cheap. Years ago, when I was beginning the rest of my life over, again, high fructose was the first thing I cut out. That first small step truly helped up my energy level. 
I began to walk more and lost a few pounds. That was the momentum needed. I set alarms and alerts until I had a more active daily routine. Small stuff like, some simple stretches. Walking to the farthest restroom. Parking in the back of the lot. Trying to use proper body mechanics when attempting to carry all my groceries in at once. I counted calories until I learned to eat healthier. You think you're doing awesome when you're eating salad with chicken on it. But oh those toppings and dressings can cause some trouble. It's taken me seven years. I have had ups and downs. I am 50 pounds lighter, happier, and frankly, sex is even better. Anyways, yeah, high fructose corn syrup. Not having it is a great place to begin a journey when you don't know where else to begin. After a while you'll most likely find it disgusting. Yes yeah, so much actually good food has been discovered by actually trying two things that shouldn't go together. But it's not that they really taste bad so much as that the concepts clash when we think about them. Both pineapples and mayo have a sour base with a bit of sweetness, it's not that bizarre. It's just that we mentally assign the first to fruit and the second to savory. Cutting the amount of sugar to make a pastry or dessert healthier. My mother-in-law does this with every single thing she makes. While yes, I'll grant that sometimes this can actually result in a better flavor, some things are legit too sweet, most of the time it results in very bland or even bitter tasting stuff, especially when cocoa powder is involved. You can't just cut sugar and leave the same amount of baking cocoa. It doesn't work that way. If you want less sugar intake, just eat less of the fucking dessert. Yep there are some recipes that are better more tart or spicy. My grandma always made pumpkin pie using the recipe on the back of a can of Libby's pumpkin, but she reduced the sugar by half and increased the other slices by a bit. Those pies are way better than any store or bakery pumpkin pie, which are almost always way too sweet. If anyone's interested in the exact amounts I can share the recipe. I promise you won't want to go back to traditional pumpkin pie. If you go back 1000 years, almost none of the authentic dishes we know today even existed in those countries. There was no pizza or pasta in Italy 1000 years ago. They only started making pasta after seeing noodles from China when trade was opened up. A lot of the Americanized ethnic dishes were actually invented by those same ethnic groups because when they came over they had to rework their recipes for the local ingredients. Right. Like, I don't mind some half serious but mainly ingest ragging on people for their food choices if everyone knows we're all just joking. I'll joke about how insane it is to good a good steak well done and eat it with ketchup, but in all seriousness, I couldn't possibly care how people enjoy their food. And you see this all the time on the food subs. Hundreds of comments actually the proper way to make it is this way and you're worse than a pedophile if you don't make it exactly the way my mommy makes it for me. It's ridiculous.